Hey everyone, my name is Gaurav Hardikar and I'll be your moderator for the today's panel on DEI and the future product management report. Uh, before we start, there's a few housekeeping items I want to mention. We have a great group of panelists here, uh, but I want to provide a disclaimer that each panelist is representing their own views and not the views of their company. And we're going to be going through questions that you're submitting. So please make sure you continue submitting, submitting on Slido or uploading others. Um, it's on the right side of the screen or next to the stage chat tab. Um, before we kind of go into the questions itself, um, I'll kick it off with some intros. Um, I'll, go, I'll just go first. Um, I'm currently VP of product at Brilliant Smart Home. I started off my career as a strategy consultant at Accenture and got into product at Trulia and Zillow Group almost a decade ago. Um, I've been involved with product school for quite some time and was a product school instructor twice. Um, I'll pass it off to Zakir to go next. Hey everyone, I'm Zach here. Uh, I currently work at Hopin, um, which we're all on right now, uh, leading one of our newer product verticals. And I've been in product management for about eight years, most of which in big tech uh, between Microsoft and Amazon and a smaller company named Shift um, that's in the e-commerce space for used cars. And I'm based out of New York. Thanks, Akir. Um, Gauri, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Gauri. I am currently working as Director of Product and Program at Zillow Group. And um, I have been with Product School for about a year. I teach a lot of their cohorts. And I am based out of Texas. Excited to be here today. Leo, how about you next? Thank you, Rav. Hi, everyone. I'm Leo. Uh, I work at Google as a global product lead. I've been dabbling in product for seven years uh, and uh, have the opportunity to, or well, we're working on ads product, Google ads product. Uh, and I've had opportunity to, to be an instructor for product school, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I'm also based in Oslo, Norway. Eva. Thanks, Graf. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Uh, have the opportunity to talk all of to talk with all of you. My name is Eva Fong. I'm the head of product for Twilio phone number team. Um, before joining Twilio, I was at Amazon HP Service. Now I also run a startup before. Um, I spent more than a decade in the enterprise world, uh, cloud and SaaS, build SaaS and cloud product. Uh, I'm also a instructor at Product School. Thanks, Eva. Um, last but not least, Marty. Hey there, I'm Marty. I am a director of product here at Salesforce. Uh, currently, I'm working on what I call Slack Force, which is um, we are rebuilding our products into Slack. And um, so I'm kind of working between both companies right now. It's a, it's a fun thing. I've um, been in product for a really, really long time. I also teach product outside of, of work at the University of Washington, Seattle. And I'm super excited to talk to everyone today. Awesome. Um, so let's get started with some of these questions. Um, I, I'll start off with Zakir to kick it off. Um, what does diversity mean to you? Yeah, so because this is product con, um, I'm going to try and tie this to product as much as we can, um, rather than give it a more generic answer. So I'm going to I'm going to tie this to diversity of thought, and then I want to get the the thoughts from the rest of the group as well. And so what I actually mean by that, and I think that's maybe a buzzword that that is being used more lately is really kind of how you how you think about the makeup of a team. Um, the makeup of the team is, of course, there's a traditional DE&I sense, but there's the aspects of personality and skill sets also playing a part of that role. And I think as you kind of have that diversity and build out the team, it's super important to have that balance because then each member of the team will have not only an equal opportunity to, um, to learn from each other, but also an equal opportunity to grow. And then I think the, the growth aspect ultimately should be driven primarily from, it becomes more focused on performance and your ability to succeed rather than focused on um, just um, quotas or any of that sort. Thanks, uh, anyone else have any thoughts uh, on, on this topic? Well, one thing I, I can think about is that I've always found diversity to mean something different to everyone, right? It's, but at its core, it's about inclusivity and being open to new ideas. Um, like anytime, uh, you know, whether you're building a product, whether you're building a team, just being transparent and open communication has always been a big thing for me, at least. 
Eva, I'll, I'll jump to you next for our next question. Um, how can you get the leadership to focus on DEI as a priority? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'll give it a, a short answer and a long answer. So the short answer is be an advocate. So what I mean by that, I think D and D, uh, diversity and inclusion is not only a leadership problem. It's not only impact the leadership, it's for all of us. So I think especially now we're at product con, we're talking to product managers, put on your owner, owner head, put on and like really take ownership to solve this problem because we are, we should all be part of it. Be the advocate to advocate for uh, diversity and inclusion culture and really help driving, take actions to drive this in your company. Meaning that you can be the advocate to talk to the leadership. You can help set goals for your team and your company. You can also set the success metrics for the DNI for your organization. So I think that by doing this, it will really get the leadership team's attention, not only the leadership, but everybody's attention to be part of the drive, part of the force to drive the diversity and inclusion. No, it makes a lot of sense. I'm um, actually curious, Marty, you know, having been at uh, Salesforce and then now trying to do this across Slack and Salesforce, is it interesting after going through that kind of merger, how that how that impacts both companies? Maybe there's something to say there. Oh, absolutely. I think, um, you know, they have very similar but distinctly different company cultures. Um, and the approach to diversity, I think, is slightly different but similar. Um, and so really the melding of these two worlds has been really fun and interesting to see. And, and we're gonna continue to meld and kind of come together, right? It's only been a few months since the acquisition closed. But uh, I think the biggest thing that we've really impressed upon both sides of the house for everyone to understand is that shared level of empathy, right? Because I think diversity really starts with having empathy for someone else's lived experience um, and understanding that their differences are there in their present, right? And so you have to be conscious to people on the other side of it who ignore diversity altogether and say like, oh, we're all we're all here together. No, 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 we're all different. But let's celebrate that and let's lean into that. And I think that helps whether you're working across two companies merging together or if you're just meeting people for the first time. No, that's an excellent point. Um, I mean, on that note, uh, I've always thought that it's about like there's a bottoms up approach as well as a top down approach to this. Like there's a lot of things you can do in your current team or your current role to kind of push this. Um, and then I think for leadership, like you can kind of set an example even within your own team to do that. Um, and also you want to discuss values and culture with the leadership team and make sure your thoughts are heard. Um, you know, Leo being at being at Google, uh, obviously a much larger company in general, how does it, how do you think that that impacts, you know, something there? No, I, I'm absolutely. You're you're 100 right that in in terms of taking ownership, and you can do that from the bottom up, as you say, and and being yourself and being being uh, in a in a psychological safe space is very important as an individual. But I think as leaders, uh, those who have the real responsibility, it's very important that they they take they go beyond their comfort zone and engage people who are not like them um, in all different uh, ways and and and, and approaches. I think especially if you want to be a good example, it's also mentoring and actually taking the time to to coach and, and bring up talent which which don't look like yourself or in any way, shape or form. I think that's that's a really good uh, opportunity to show and demonstrate to others that there is an opportunity to to learn if you engage with others. And we all know better, better, more diverse team produce better products. It's that simple. Thanks, Leo. Anyone else have anything to say on this topic? I'll just chime in real quick. Quick, um, just from a Hopin standpoint, uh, I think I think as the world moves closer to being like more remote, more more spread out, um, it's kind of on leadership to think about how you structure your teams to be present in many parts of the world. And by by nature of doing that, you're itself enabling diversity. And I think so. The empathy component that we talked about earlier, I think once you bring the the empathetic aspect to that then um, you kind of have the best of, of both worlds, both uh, geographically and then kind of internally as well in terms of the culture. So I think that's going to be super important as more companies embrace that uh, remote global workforce over time. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I think one of the things we haven't covered here, but what's also important from a whole company perspective too, 
it is hiring, right? We are in the great resignation. Um, there's tons of roles open. People are hiring more than they ever did. And so a great way to infuse um, diversity, new perspectives into your products are by hiring people with, you know, these, um, you know, different perspectives. You know, that's something I impress all the time. Like we can't hire people who just love our products. Let's hire somebody who hates it and who wants to come in and fix it too. They're going to bring yeah. a, a level of energy that we probably need around here. Um, and, and that's important too. That's a, that's yeah, a great that's point. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, I think the upcoming future of product management report that Product School has been working on also showed this trend because the um, product management is one of the fast growing role uh, on the market today. And a lot of companies have this pipeline problem. It's really embracing the diversity and inclusion will help the companies build a pipeline and grow their talent pool. So I think this is definitely very crucial for the business growth also. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for saying that, Eva. So I'll jump to the next question. Um, when promoting DEI among leaders, how, to ha how do you handle the statement around merit? Many leaders say we only go by merit and we can't compromise on it to hire for diversity. Leo, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I would say the, the 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 simple answer is you never compromise when you are when you're worse, right? But at the same time, you want people who are talented. Mm -hmm. But if you if you only look for people who look like yourself, uh, who have your had your same experiences that you've had, you won't find uh, the the true the true talent, right? So I would I would rephrase this a bit around uh, merit and and talent. I think that's totally different things. The good thing about product as a, as a field of, of uh, an area to work on is that you can bring a lot of perspective with a lot of diverse backgrounds. So why not embrace that in all the all the the, the in, in all the different ways that's possible to to embrace? Um, I I think it's to, to be fair also the, the question around especially you know for the last part of the the question of many leaders say we only go by merit. If if, if you if that, that's the attitude in in leadership group, you need to yeah there, there needs to be some some coaching here, um, both from uh, the top perspective but also from from bottom actually say. Uh, individual uh, product people can go up and say, "Hey, this is not right." Right? I mean, we want to have people who are based on the talent and the opportunities they have, just like Sakir mentioned earlier today, uh, earlier. And it's very important that we we really embrace uh, the opportunity to get people who know how to grow and know how to learn, and then see how good they are, not just uh, based on you know they have great degrees or or uh, come from an interesting company. Oh, great points. I, um, I think oh, what Leo actually mentioned because I think merit should be one of the criteria and it should not be the only criteria. I think that's that's the argument here. So merit should obviously play a big role, but once you get past that, you want to make sure that you have a diverse pool of candidates that you're looking at and not like focused on one of them. Like I, I definitely remember an experience where when I was talking to one of them hiring managers about a role to which I had referred a candidate. Um, he mentioned that the candidate did not make it who I had referred, but they ended up hiring uh, someone for the role. And he was like, oh, he was he was white and American. So no wonder he got it. That was a historic uh, you know, comment because it, it means that the rest of them were not from a diverse school or, or they were not like people were biased towards it. So that's where we are. We are trying to make a change and, and merit definitely plays a big role in here. So I, I don't think anyone wants to uh, question that, but I think there should be a, a big shift towards considering a wide variety of candidates. Yeah, I, I think I'm I'm actually concerned, right? That merit in diversity and it's even being in this context together, right? Um, I don't think that you have to sacrifice one or the other to get the right candidate. Um, if you have the appropriate sourcing and recruiting things, you should always be getting diverse pools. And if you're not getting diverse pools, those are systemic issues that you have to fix within your own company. And then once you've done that, there those things aren't you're not choosing between, right? You're just trying to find the best candidate for the role um, and, and figure out how to do that. And then once people are in roles too, right? And you're moving people up, you know, same thing. You should not have to, those are not two vectors that should be going or battling head to head. Um, and when they are, it actually makes me more concerned about the person on the other side of it who's thinking that way. So as a hiring manager for uh, for many companies, uh, I hired a lot of 
product managers for different companies. Um, I don't think I totally agree. I don't think merit and the diversity are a conflict with each other. But on the other hand, to hire diverse candidates and build this pool with diverse candidates does take longer. So I would suggest that I think like from the hiring perspective, that may require product managers, the, the, the leaders who are hiring product managers to really be mindful and that, uh, spend effort to build this diverse pool. And it will take longer and may take some planning from the organization perspective to hire, to hire this role. Um, to pipeline this role and take a little longer time to have the opportunity for the diverse candidates to apply to get into this pipeline. Yeah, it's actually it's it's uh, really good to hear you guys say all this stuff because yeah, it's another another point is a lot of people might be sticking to like a specific like historical evaluation criteria for candidates, right? Like what they qualify, what they think is qualified. Um, historically, but if a company is good, like Marty, you talked about, hey, it's important to tie this to the hiring practice and even you're talking about, you know, how you've hired across multiple multiple companies. If you start to take a look at the cultural and company values, you may find that the evaluation criteria itself is kind of flawed and you need to take a better look at how you qualify candidates. Um, I think that's probably as you go, as as companies do take DNI more seriously, that is probably something to take a look at. So uh, I'm gonna pass it to Marty for the next question. Um, how can product teams and human resources work together to advance DEI initiatives? Yeah, so I think this one's really interesting. Um, and so for context, I, I worked in, in an intersection of a bit of both of this, right? So one of the companies I worked at was Workday, right? Which is like your biggest HR company. Then I also, but I worked there as a product manager. And so these same kind of things came up quite a bit. And so what I think has worked really well and I'm seeing as a trend um, around different companies, right? No matter if they're enterprise or consumer focused is leveraging the ERG groups, right? Leveraging um, the employee resource groups to allow them to have a seat at the table when it comes to products. So think about it this way. You know, your company has these groups of historically marginalized people, uh, people from really diverse perspectives, right? They know their groups really, really well. And so what if you use them kind of almost like a focus group to look at some of the new products that you're releasing, look at some of the algorithms, some of the things that you're putting together and giving them an opportunity to weigh in almost as these internal consultants. And so many things are caught in that process. So many things are are causing uh, companies to get check different things, go back to the drawing board on certain features or products that they're releasing and think, hey, are we trying to, um, are we leveraging all the groups, right? And that's a, a way to take a, a group that has historically been a little bit more focused on culture at a company and, and giving them a real business need and business purpose um, to make things better. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, Eva, given given your experience hiring at so many different companies, is there anything that you can share as well on this one? Uh, so I, I totally agree with uh, what has been said. And just from the hiring manager perspective, I think this is not really. Uh, I think this is a definitely a, a pressing issue. And um, yeah, I don't have anything to build on, on top of that. Yeah, I, I, uh, some comments for me. I think that like there's a lot you can do from going back to that bottoms up versus top down kind of approach. Like, I think when you're hiring within your team, I think each team does have a lot of say into how they're hiring. So you do you can actually influence that quite a bit. And like you know, as you were saying, Marty, usually you have an HR business partner or whatever it is to kind of you know figure that out. Um, that will make a big difference by you know bottoms up providing that that influence. Uh, but even you know as that changes and then maybe you have a team that's performing just a lot better because of these kind of uh, changes that are made for DE&I. And I, that, can be a, that can be an example for the company and can actually make changes along a long way too. So that's just something oh, yeah, that's, that's I, I've a seen. Whole other, other vector I totally forgot about though yeah. is when you are hiring, right? And you're trying to figure out how to structure teams for success, right? Having those teams and kind of intentionally thinking about how you're bringing in 
um, people with um, diverse perspectives, right? And diversity isn't necessarily, I want to make sure we're thinking of it like in totality, right? It's not just necessarily uh, race, sexuality, you know, all those things. It's also your personal ethics. It's how you think about the world and how you want to impact other people. All of that factors into what makes you different and what makes you diverse. And so being mindful um, at, with your HR business partner, especially as a people leader, to say that, hey, I want these diverse perspectives. I want to bring in a team of people that are different, that have these different backgrounds. Um, there, there's a way to leverage them there and to do that in a way that makes sense for everyone and makes everyone feel comfortable because you don't want someone to be like, oh, I just want to bring your team because, you know, I think you're different, right? <laughs> like, but actually um, having a meaningful reason that makes everybody feel good. So, no, thanks a lot for that, uh, Marty. Uh, so the next question that I have for Gori is, what are some metrics for DEI? Thanks, Laura. I think I think one of the ways to look at it is, and now that we have talked so much about hiring, to look at how we can think about DEI at every single level of the company, right? So now that companies are already focusing on getting the right pool of candidates getting the right set of people in the door. We also want to think about not just diversity, inclusion, and equity at like the entry level, but also at every level of leadership. Because what happens is that we do have a lot of diversity within like a particular set of levels, but as you go up, you see that the diversity starts decreasing more and more and more. So having that metrics across every single level would be a good first step. Secondly, also looking at like, you know, how do you think about uh, DEI when you do your promotions, like within your teams, just consciously Paying attention to that is a big is a big win for the company. For example, you see that there is not a lot of women representation at the leadership because, as and when you see people moving through that ladder, a lot of women have to put their families in front because they don't have the right level of support. So, if companies step up and then provide the right level of support, I am pretty sure that they will be successful and they will be able to move up the ladder too. So, keeping that in mind is also one of the other ways you can do it. And the next and most important thing is probably pay equity, right? Like um, that is a big one that a lot of companies are now paying attention to, making sure that people are paid equitably across different levels across the you know, the company. So keeping all of these mind is, is, you know, an important aspect of how you measure some of your DEI initiatives. And it's not just important to do this at like an entry level or at a mid level. You have to keep doing it at every level so that people keep progressing through it and it doesn't just stall at like one level of leadership. So I think that's more important to keep in mind. No, thanks for that thorough answer. That's that's awesome. Um, sure. Marty, Eva, Leo, anyone else have a have an answer here in terms of what's happening at in your companies for DEI and i or is it here too? Um, slightly different, not necessarily a metric, but a process in play um, is uh, a few years ago, we spun up a, a full team to focus on um, ethics and inclusion within our product space. And so we have made ethics and inclusion review, or we're trying to get it you know, fully baked out, but ethics and inclusion review as important as a security review. So when you are going to ship out a new product, it goes through, you know, security review, make sure everything's sound, but you also go through ethics and compliance. You also go through um, a, uh, what's the one, other one, you know, accessibility review, all these different things. And so all the steps to releasing product now, that is now one of your vectors is to go and take whatever algorithms you, you build or whatever products, new products you're using, or depending on what kind of data you're collecting, all of that, Go run it with the ethics and inclusion team and, and see um, if you are, you know, impacting any marginalized groups. That's a great point. I uh, I think the concept of an inclusive product is like fairly new, but I think it is something that, you know, you're going to see more and more down the line. Um, I, I was actually just like presenting a PowerPoint slide uh, yesterday and then it came up with a prompt that said, hey, do you want to enable subtitles for, you know, being more inclusive? And I'm like, well, that's cool. Like I didn't expect that to pop up, but it is one, just one example that like, you know, it's starting to, you know, you talked about accessibility, like, you know, websites definitely get graded on that. You want to be more accessible in every, every part you can. So that, that is a really good point to bring up. Since we have, uh, uh, so we have a couple more, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leo. Yeah, just, just to add, I think it is important that we, we, we also think of the metrics, but also think of the impact, right? So uh, for a lot of areas, there's, you know, looking at it, if you have like a hundred percent growth of, whatever, you know, say you're looking for a diverse set of group you want to hire, people you want to hire, 
hundred percent growth doesn't really matter if you have two people and you now have four people and it should have two hundred. So it, it's it's that impact element I would argue that if you, you try to look for okay, but what are we doing the right things? Should we just you know don't pat yourself on the back just for you know having you putting out reports? And I know a lot of companies are doing that, but I think it's very important that you go beyond the report and look at actually what what has been changed, how are we changing our process, how are we actually working on this? Like so. You know, for us, we work a lot on diversity. It's a really core, th core thing to what we do. Uh, but I think we, any company can be better at this. And you just need to keep keep really focus on on driving that up, not just from a metrics perspective, but also look at the impact perspective. Great point. So we have a couple yeah. of minutes left. So there's one more. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Eva. Yeah, I think what really resonated with me is uh, have the measurement at each job function and at each level. Because um, just personal experience, I joined a, a women leadership group is all for women at executive and senior management positions. And then I noticed one thing is at, in this group, most women holding the traditional women jobs, like head of HR or uh, head of marketing. But when it comes to product and engineering, it's, the, the ratio for women leaders is very, uh, compared to the other jobs, is much lower. So I, I really hope like for, for us, we can drive that for every single job. So we open doors for diverse candidates, not only women, but for everybody. And so it's not really like certain jobs for women, certain jobs for um, other types of people. So we have a couple minutes left. Um, so we'll try to go as much as we can in this last question. Um, so there might be a generational gap between individuals and my corporation. How would you approach DEI keeping this in mind? And uh, Zakir, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, I think um, I think in some ways having uh, a diverse uh, group of you, you can think of it as like an almost an advisory board in some ways internally that encompasses both generations or multiple generations would naturally I think help that um, I think if you can bring those the perspectives from each of those uh, generations into the fold then again naturally you're gonna be able to to have that diversity of thought so I would probably start with that um, it's probably the first thing that comes to mind I would add in there too, um, I don't know, maybe it's just my work style. I like to just knock everything out on the head. <laughs> so I would start with that, like, hey, we have a generational gap. So I'm gonna preface this conversation with the fact that half of our workforce is one place and half of our workforce is maybe in another stage in their career. However, here's what I'm seeing and here's where, you know, I'm wanting to make a change or wanting to see impact. And I think anytime you are bringing things up, especially things that are a little bit more sensitive, it is so important to be, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, um, oriented towards um, success and trying to figure out something that works for everybody. If you are coming from a really pure place that always resonates. And so kind of hitting things on the top of the head and then coming in with a lot of authenticity and, and a pure kind of hearted nature and wanting to have get to a solution, right? I'm not just bringing this up to be another employee griping. Um, I think always really resonates and it can start the conversation in a positive way. I think this is a great question because diversity also means age diversity also. So we, I see um, companies that only have, for example, young folks in, in their 20s or 30s, and then they will use culture fit to filter out the candidates that are, that are older. Uh, so uh, I think that when we think about the diversity, we should also think about it like generations and also approaching that, um, address the gap, like have people from different, not only different backgrounds, but different age groups. Thanks, Eva. And thanks every, thanks to all of the panelists um, for kind of going through these questions. It's been it's been a pleasure. So it's been really fun. Um, I'm going to spend a few, few minutes talking about kind of the, the future product management report. Um, so this is the fourth one we're doing. We've brought together a working group of product leaders from, you know, a bunch of different top tech companies to call out these trends. Um, have obviously a couple of people on this panel that actually we've worked with on that. So Zakir, Leo, and Eva, we've been working together on that this, this last couple of weeks, um, actually months. And uh, we've launched a survey. We've received over four and a half thousand respondents from the product school community or the product community in general. So that's huge. 
Uh, we're going to be able to identify a bunch of key trends uh, that, that definitely will include things on DEI, hiring and retention, a lot of the topics we talked about today. Um, and it's going to be, you know, talking about what's product led expansion of the product career path, um, especially if you're a people manager or, or if you're, you know, aspiring PM and, and the thing, it's going to relate to you. Uh, the final report is going to launch on March 29th of, of this year, and it's not too late to get involved. So, you know, you can still fill out the mini survey. You can look for, there's a link underneath the stage. You can simply scroll up or in the tabs next to the chat on the right side. You can also find the link there. Um, we would love for you to fill out that link and it'd be, or that survey, and it'd be really helpful for us. Um, some things to just talk about in terms of what we have found out from DNI from the survey. Um, you know, we know that uh, something that Eva was talking about before, because of the growth of product management and the, and the kind of the immaturity of the talent pipelines, uh, recruiters are having to broaden their searches and they're looking for qualified candidates. And that's just naturally diversifying the talent pool. So when you put the pressure on industry recruiting to create this pipeline, that should actually result in more diversity in candidates itself. Um, so you're going to keep reaching out to different diverse candidates, and that should actually help product leaders understand what they're up against and help them adjust their expectations, the evaluation criteria, a lot of the things we just talked about. Um, low code and no code tools are also making it uh, possible for PMs to break in to product from different non-technical fields. Um, and now like, you know, like people on my team, for example, like, you know, they're not all from a technical background and that's, that's totally fine. Uh, people can even build specific products from zero to one without having a full engineering team. So a lot of things are changing and that's just something to kind of acknowledge. Um, more than, you know, some, some data points that also might be helpful. More than 50% of product people have a background in non-product roles. Um, you know, the gender distribution does remain skewed. Um, it's about 34% female versus, you know, 66%, you know, male. And then 23% of PMs have a business educational background versus 50% have a CS background, um, according to Amplitude. So we're seeing a lot of a lot of things, um, you know, change in the industry, and I'm I'm really excited uh, for for Product School to share that with everyone in the product community. Um, but thanks everyone, you know, for their time, and uh, you know, make sure if you you know sign do the sign up link for the survey and uh, return back to the main stage for more.